Loved ones. Management 3130, Principles of Management. Um, to this, uh, this video is for session five. If we were meeting face to face, it would be Friday, 26 June of 2020. Um, we're going to talk about the material in chapter four, which essentially deals with managing across borders. Before we get there, though, I need to mention something to you that's a big deal because your first midterm is next week. Uh, our next class, which will be Monday the 29th, the midterm will cover chapters one through four. It is short essay. Please be reminded, I told you this in the uh, earlier videos, that an essay test requires a short essay, not bullet points or two sentences. So please write a short essay that demonstrates to me that you understand the concept and that you can communicate it well. And um, it will open on the 29th. It'll be due no later than the 30th. And after the 30th, I will pull it down. Uh, and and uh, to the extent that you even submit it after the 30th will be a great penalty. So. Midterm number one next week on Monday, um, which will be, I guess, our session six. Um, so let me go to, to uh, chapter four today, ah, but I have a note before I do. I think I told you in the Rules of Engagement video, my decision rules for using YouTube, uh, it, fundamentally it came down to me answering just a few questions. One was, what platform is accessible from anywhere any device, any time, and, and, and does that platform have reliability? So my choice was YouTube, and from my perspective and from the feedback I'm getting from my kids, it was a, it was a good choice. So I was contacted by Disney, by the film people at Disney, and I can only assume, only assume, that it's because I, I have a presence on YouTube and probably 35 or 40 videos now. Um, but the reason that they approached me is they wanted to uh, open a dialogue. They wanted to discuss me doing a voiceover for a, for a, uh, for a character that will be in Frozen 3. Apparently Disney's planning on Frozen 3. Uh, um, I know nothing about production or release dates or anything else. But they've invited me to be the voice of Dork the Caribou. If the pay is good, I might. Um, I've got a lot to consider. For example, I have no intention of joining the Screen Actors Guild. Uh, I, I fundamentally disapprove of unions and I will not be a member of one. Uh, so there's a lot to answer, to be sure, but uh, it may be a neat opportunity, we'll see. Just wanted to share that with you. So now let's talk about chapter four, managing across borders. Um, the opening conversation in this chapter is on page 118. It's, it's sort of a fuzzy discussion about globalization. And, and in fairness, globalization probably became a reality maybe 30, 35 years ago, maybe in the middle 80s. Um, there were many nations on, on every continent that thought globalization would, would bring remarkable benefits. And it turns out that that's not true. There have been a lot of nation states and a lot of people who have lost, who have lost ground significantly. Um, I would point out that probably in the last 10 years, maybe even fewer years than that, maybe anywhere from two to five, there is, I believe, a fundamental shift worldwide away from globalization, the sort of business cooperation all across the planet, to nationalism. Um, I, I can identify six countries, I guess, but forgive me, four right now that, that, are, that are strikingly good examples. China, under Mr. Z, if that's the correct pronunciation of his name. Um, China is hyper-nationalistic and, and is trying to impose its way not just in, in that region of Asia, but all over the world. The United States, um, President Trump, was elected on a campaign slogan that said, I will make America great again. And he has done things that, that just clearly show that that is his commitment. Uh, he clean, keenly focused to, to benefiting the citizens of this country rather than benefiting the citizens of Germany or any other place in the world. Uh, Britain, didn't Britain just go through Brexit? And Brexit was not a decision that politicians made, it was a referendum. 
electorate, the people of Britain said, we want to disassociate ourselves from the European Union. We don't want to take orders from Brussels. We don't want to send our treasure there to be squandered by mindless bureaucrats that don't care anything about England or the other nation states. Um, so, so the point is that Britain's gone through Brexit. Um, Brazil has a relatively new president. His last name is Bolsonaro. He's doing all sorts of things that benefit Brazilians. And of course, he's making mistakes. We all would in, in a role that, uh, that challenging. But I'm looking at major countries all over the world, the US, China, Britain, Brazil, that are saying, no, stop it. We're tired of globalization. Our people lose. Benefits do not accrue to our citizens. So we, the leadership of these nation states all over the world, Asia, North America, South America, Europe, we are gonna do things that benefit our citizens, our nation. So the reality is that, again, for 35 years or, or thereabouts, there was this big push for globalization. Let's do business all over the world in, in the hopes that this cooperation would, would, uh, would, would, would lift everyone, but that has not been the reality. There are also, um, in this discussion of globalization and nationalism as, as it relates to commerce and business primarily, also, the authors um, talk about offshoring, U.S. firms having things manufactured in other countries as if it is some terrible, evil thing. Really? Isn't that what globalization would be? But here's a reality, and, 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 and the authors, and this is, this is really sad and naive that they would miss things, this visible is important. There are at least three big reasons for U.S. firms offshoring, making stuff in other countries that, um, that they miss. The first is, and, and this is, it, you can look at history, you can look at, at resolutions and corporate board minutes and all sorts of things. Unions in this country have imposed all sorts of restrictive work rules and engage in open hostility like class warfare. And, and management simply realizes that if you cannot pacify or accommodate the unions, you just literally make the stuff in another country. Uh, there are data that suggest that right after World War II, about 30, which would have been 1945, 75 years ago, I guess, um, about 35% of the American workers, more than a third, in the private sector were unionized. More than a third of the workforce was unionized. Now, 2020, 6%. American workers have realized that unions, if they ever played a positive role, no longer do. They impose restrictive work rules, companies can't adapt, they can't be flexible, they can't respond because there are these restrictive work rules and there is open hostility. So many companies have said, instead of doing this with the unionized workforce in the United States, we'll just ship it uh, offshore. Another thing that, that has changed, but only in the last year, year and a half, and that is for decades, the United States had the highest, the most expensive corporate income tax rate in the world. Our corporate income tax rates were in the high 30s in terms of percentages. And at the same time, you can look at countries like Ireland that are 11 or 12%. So that is a powerful impetus for, for American firms to do their manufacturing in other places where the tax burden is not as great. And under prior administrations, there was this enormous growth in regulations, restrictions on the way businesses could conduct themselves. In no way wholesome or positive, just restrictive. And, and the truth is, President Trump is, is uh, just started his, I guess completed rather, his third year of the presidency. 2020 is now an election year. And of course he was inaugurated in January of 17, so he's just completed three years. Whether you love him or hate him is immaterial your likes or dislikes are, are, are not in any way relevant to this conversation. He is the most consequential president of my lifetime. He's done things with working with Congress, which in, in parts of Congress despise him openly. He's done things that have meaningfully reduced the corporate income tax rate to make the environment more competitive for American companies. He's reduced regulations across all sorts of domains. Um, of course, he's done positive things with foreign policy and, and uh, funding the military, just a number of things. So whether you love him or you hate him, uh, what he has done has been very positive, very beneficial 
to us as a nation state. And, and particularly in two of the three things that drove American firms offshore, a massive reduction in corporate income tax rates and a significant and healthy reduction in regulations imposed on businesses. So now, I'm on 126 and the authors ask a question and they answer it, of course. Why would any company expand beyond its home country? So let me do this from the perspective that we're talking about a firm that is domestic to the United States, an American corporation. What would ever make it want to do business anywhere in the globe? Well, of course, they talk about stuff that, that is very intuitive. New markets. Um, if I manufacture swimsuits, if I do, there are about 330 million people in the United States. There are 7.2 billion people in the world. If you put 330 million over 7.2 billion, you'll find that it's a decimal fraction that's roughly equal to 5%. So if I decide to sell in other countries, that dramatically expands the size of my market. Not everybody has discretionary income, I understand that. But the point is the US population only represents 5% of the world's population. So this thing about new markets is a big deal. In some cases, companies, let's, again, we're sticking with this, this model that we're gonna look at an American firm that chooses to go offshore. We could just as easily look at a German firm that decides to do business in America or in Portugal or anywhere else. But for the purposes of this discussion, we'll, we'll consider an American firm going offshore to other nations. Um, Sometimes, if we go offshore, we have access to resources that, that don't exist here. Um, I didn't know what I'm about to share with you until my wife and I went on safari. Our honeymoon was a, was a three-country African safari. We went to Mozambique, Zimbabwe, and the Republic of South Africa. I didn't know until I was in Zimbabwe that Zimbabwe is the source of about 75% of the world's chromium. Uh, chromium is an ore, just like iron is an ore, it's extracted from the ground. And, and so my point is, if you're a company and you need chrome, you need to line uh, vessels, pipes, rifle barrels, you, you put uh, chrome on automobile parts like bumpers and all sorts of things like that. Chrome has hundreds of industrial applications. 75% of the raw material comes from Zimbabwe. You better have a good relationship with, with the people who, who extract that ore from Zimbabwe. So sometimes we have to go to other places to get resources. And it isn't just, you know, natural resources. It, it's talent, it's human resources. Um, for example, India, the nation state of India. Every year in the United States, we, we uh, graduate about 25,000 engineers, uh, whatever their disciplines are, whether they're industrial engineers, electrical, mechanical, civil, chemical. We graduate about 25,000 engineers. Every year, India graduates 125,000 engineers. So they, they literally graduate five times as many young engineers as we do on an annual basis. So a lot of American firms have turned to, to India for engineering applications, especially in the computer sciences. So one of the reasons that any firm would, would be inclined to do business offshore is it might that might give, that, that decision might give the company access to resources that it doesn't have in its home market. Um, there are also things that represent um, constraints on business. Uh, I'm, I'm thinking primarily of tariffs and quotas. Uh, for a number of years, the United States had a voluntary quota system with Japan, and it, 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 my memory is, this would be so easy to verify, my memory is that this, this voluntary agreement that we signed with Japan said something like this, that the Japanese will only export or not export more than two million cars made in Japan to the United States every year. So um, what that means is if you're a Japanese company and you're manufacturing automobiles and you intend to sell them in the United States, there's a cap, there's an upper limit. And beyond that, you can't, you can't go because you have this voluntary export quota. So, and, and the same thing is true of tariffs. But, but my point is, if you were a Japanese company and you produced in the United States, uh, Toyota has a factory in Georgetown, Kentucky. Um, Mercedes has a factory in, in Alabama. Um, Volvo, I, I'm not sure if they have a factory here in the States right now. I'm really not sure. 
But my point is there must be 35 or 40 transplants. Members of the global automotive manufacturers community that have manufacturing facilities in the United States. So they're not subject to quotas or tariffs or anything else. Um, there's another piece of that, and, and, and as long as I'm talking about this, you know, we're answering this messy question, why would you do business offshore? <coughs> Excuse me, please. <coughs> If I can stick with Japan and the auto industry for just a moment, uh, Japan has a number of, forgive me, Toyota has a number of manufacturing facilities in the United States. I know Georgetown, Kentucky, they have one uh, somewhere in the Texas Hill Country that manufactures Tundras, their full-size pickup. I'm certain there are others. I just, I know of those two because of my own life experiences. Um, if Toyota were building everything in Japan and shipping it across the Pacific to get the United States, Toyota has two exposures because it is trans-shipping stuff. The first is, if it's building in Japan, it's building in yen and then selling in US dollars. And if those currencies move in ways that are unfavorable, just on the basis of the currency volatility, Toyota could lose money. If they build it in the United States, they're building in US dollars and selling in US dollars. And there's no potential whatsoever for currency fluctuations. They also don't have the, the cost of, of trans-shipping um, vehicles across the Pacific. They have the cost of building factories here, but that is beneficial or they wouldn't have done it. So uh, currency vol volatility, building and selling in, in uh, US dollars, uh, favorable taxation and regulations. I mentioned earlier that uh, Ireland has much more favorable corporate income tax rates in the United States. Uh, there are many American companies that have a manufacturing presence in Ireland. So, so there are all kinds of reasons that a company would be motivated to do business offshore. Now, I'm on page 127 right now, figure 4-1, and what the authors present is a model for global expansion. And I want to put it on the whiteboard because I want, I want to demonstrate something to you that I think is pretty useful. strategies for global expansion on the whiteboard. The first one is outsourcing. I'll talk about each of these in depth. Outsourcing, then exporting. This strategy is to either license or franchise. The fourth one is a joint venture. Again, I'll talk about each of these. And this pseudo acronym DFI means direct foreign investment. That is used so often in the study of international business. It's like me saying CEO. If I said CEO, most of you would say, I just described a chief executive officer. So in the literature of international business, DFI is used so commonly that most people don't say direct foreign investment. What that would be, of course, is building a factory in, in somebody's, in, in, a, in another country. So let me start with next, oh, forgive me, with outsourcing. Outsourcing essentially says that we, we look across the world and we find a, a source of anything, labor, materials, expertise, whatever the case may be, that puts us in a beneficial position. Uh, what if, what if engineers who are educated and trained in India have the same competencies as American educated engineers, but they'll work for 30 cents on the dollar? Same outcome, significantly lower cost. So, Many companies have many different reasons to outsource, but this is typically the first, the first international strategy companies engage in if they're going to do business globally. So outsourcing just says that you leave your own nation state. You go somewhere else to gather resources, to do something that, that benefits you. Exporting is precisely what you would think it means. Export says that, again, we're gonna stick with an American firm. You manufacture in this country. You build stuff or make stuff in America, and then you ship it to other places. 
pretty straightforward concept. Um, licensing and franchising. To license or franchise says that you own, uh, you have the rights to some business concept or you own intellectual property. Let me talk to you about first licensing and then franchising. These are very, very common ways for any firm, but we'll go with an American firm, to have a footprint, a presence in some other part of the world. Um, here's an example of licensing, and it's probably a useful one. Let's assume that I am Monsanto. If my memory serves, Monsanto is a big chemical company, and, and it was scientists and engineers at Monsanto 40 years ago or so that developed the first a substitute for sugar. I think it's called saccharin. Again, we can verify that or we can either disconfirm it, but I think it was Monsanto who developed the first artificial sweetener, the first substitute for sugar, and, and, uh, and of course then brought it to market. Now, what that means is in the United States, let's assume they only had a patent in the United States. So they have intellectual property protection in the United States. What if some other company said, gee, we'd like to manufacture and distribute this, could we enter into a licensing agreement? And if Monsanto said yes, this other company would say, okay, I'm making this up. Here's a half a million bucks, that's the fee for the licensing agreement, and we'll pay you a royalty of 10 cents for every pound of saccharin that we sell or distribute. So a licensing agreement says that someone possesses intellectual property, and for a fee, and then subsequent royalties, the holder, the possessor of that intellectual property permits someone else to manufacture and distribute it. And, and of course, licensing can happen all over the globe. Um, franchising is, is not even a similar concept, but, but these two are often paired together. Uh, Domino's Pizza, significant presence in the US market. Domino's has been crushing it in Japan for 25 or 30 years. Domino's franchised that concept to some people in Japan, and it had a huge international presence by virtue of, of, of uh, Japan probably has a population equal to or larger than ours. It's probably about 350 million. So Domino's has been franchising pizza stores there for 25 years, which means that they get a franchise fee, and then they get royalties on every piece of round pie that, uh, that the Japanese franchisees sell. So Domino took its business offshore with no investment whatsoever. It, it had the concept, it permitted people to buy into the system who were based in another country and it's worked well. Now, a joint venture. A joint venture is essentially a partnership of sorts, but I mean that in a generic sense, not in a legal sense. A joint venture definitionally is when two or more companies create a third. Two or more companies join together to carry out some venture. I mentioned earlier today that, that I've been on safari in, uh, in Zimbabwe. Um, when my wife and I arrived in, in, uh, in Zimbabwe, we flew into Harare, the capital city, and we overnighted, uh, and then the next morning we drove from, from uh, our, our host's home to uh, a general aviation airport. We took a bush flight to Mozambique and spent, spent a week Mozambique on the Zambezi River. Great, great experience. Um, as we drove across town from our host's home to the General Aviation Airport, where we took this flight, this bush flight to Mozambique, we drove past a Coca-Cola bottling facility. So here I am 12,000 miles from home, and there's Coca-Cola right on the side of the road. And I asked my host, who's a Zimbabwe national, I said, Taki, do you know the history of that? And he said, I do. Uh, it was in his hometown. He said, a number of years ago, that was a, a Zimbabwean bottler company that just bottled soft drinks and sold them in this market. And Coca-Cola approached them and said, look, we'd like to form a joint venture. Here's what we'll do. We, Coca-Cola, will give you syrup and marketing support and cash and a bunch of other stuff. And you, the Zimbabwean bottler, bottle the stuff and distribute it because you know this market. You know where the restaurants are. You know where the grocery stores are. You know what, what local tastes and preferences are. You understand the customs and the culture of this country, and we don't. So Coca-Cola and this Zimbabwean bottling company joined together to create a third company, and that was this Coca-Cola bottling plant that we drove by, and of course they, it was beneficial for everybody. Coke now had a presence in Zimbabwe, the bottling plant got syrup, 
tech support, marketing support, good stuff. So a joint venture, two or more companies create a third venture with some commercial purpose in mind. They each contribute some assets. And DFI is a direct foreign investment. That's what happens when a company says, all right, we're going to build a structure, a facility in your nation. Uh, that happens so often. Um, uh, so many American firms do that. Uh, IBM probably has a presence in 120 countries in the world, a physical presence. Now, could it be a distribution facility? Could it be a, like a tech support or field support facility? It could. Could it be a manufacturing facility? Of course it could. Of course it could. So my point is that I wanted to show you this, even though this appears in that uh, figure 4.1 in the text on page 127, I wanted to put it on the board because I wanted to try, first of all, to bring these different strategies to life so that you understand them. But I presented them to you in this format because I want you to understand that what I've given you, what I've discussed, is least expensive to most expensive, least risky to most risky. Let me use exporting as an example. If we are exporting, we just make stuff in this country. And before we even make it, we have our manufacturer's representatives in another nation, Belgium or Brazil or wherever, take orders because they have catalogs and samples. So they take the orders, they transmit the orders to us, we build and ship it. So we're in a good place. We only make as much as we know has been pre-sold. We haven't invested anything. We have no exposure to loss. So if the market goes away, we just stop manufacturing those incremental units. So exporting is a very low price, low cost, low risk sort of a strategy. If you have a, if you decide to build a factory in another country, you're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars, aren't you? And if anything happens, that is a sunk cost, whether it's expropriation or civil war or who knows what. So the way that that I've presented this, I've, I've pulled from that figure in the textbook. From outsourcing to direct foreign investment is to go from the least expensive strategy to the most expensive strategy, and from the strategy that has the lowest risk to the strategy that has the highest risk. And again, that's partly why I wanted to take the time to put that on the whiteboard. So, ah. I'm on page 138 right now, and uh, I have to look at the copyright of this textbook. I cannot remember what it is, maybe 2018, I just don't remember. No, 2020. So, previous editions, 2018, 2016, 2013. The copyright for the ninth edition of this is 2020. But here's what I want to share with you. The authors talk in here, in, in the textbook on page 138, about a group of countries that, that go by this acronym BRICS. And it is, uh, it is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. That's what BRICS is, or where it comes from. And, and uh, what they do in the textbook is they just say, Oh, these are developing nations and they're remarkable and they're on this upward trajectory. Wrong! Not even close. Three of the five countries are struggling significantly. So my point is that change is fast and it's brutal. Uh, Russia is, is so reliant on the sale of crude oil. And if the market, the price for crude oil goes down, so do revenues, and that means that Russia can't afford to fund anything from the government. Not a lot of private industry there. Most of it is, is, is owned by corrupt co-ventures with politicians. Uh, China's not struggling. India is. Republic of South Africa is on so many dimensions. Currency, agriculture, uh, export. So three of the five countries that they hold out as being exemplars, really great examples of globalization, are crashing. Change is quick and change is brutal, often. I want now to talk to you about um, cultural dimensions of doing business, and this is big stuff. I need some board space. 
So let me tell you the, the genesis of this uh, discussion of cultural differences. It, it's powerful stuff. I have to take you back about, gee, I guess 40 years, back to about 1980. There was a, uh, an IBM vice president. He was a senior vice president of human resource management. And his name is Gert Hofstede. H-O-F-S-T-E-D-E. -E. You don't need to remember that. But it's important that I make the attribution that you know where this comes from. So, Hofstede is, uh, is terminally degree. I think he's got a PhD in something uh, in the organizational sciences. And he's a senior VP with IBM. And he said, we do business all over the world. And, and our managers have difficulty taking the, the culture, the experiences from their home nation to interact with others. So I want to study cultural differences and he got permission from senior management at IBM to do this enormous study, to gather data from IBM employees all over the world because at the time, they were probably in at least 120 countries and there may be 180 or 190 in the world. I'm including New Jersey. I think that's a foreign nation. All you all have to do is watch four minutes of Jersey Shore and you will know that those are not so, Hofstede gets permission from the senior management at IBM to conduct this massive survey. And at the time, IBM probably had 150,000 employees, and his response rate was stunning because the company endorsed it. They said, please participate. I don't remember precisely, but it was something like maybe 48%. I've done survey research for my entire career. If you get 2% response rate, you've done something remarkable. But Hofstede had enormously broad participation from IBM employees all over the world, and that's big stuff. So he did some factor analytics stuff, some data reduction techniques, and he said, what, what do these data mean? So as he did the analytics, what came out of this was he identified five dimensions on which cultures differ, and I need to take just a moment to put them on the board. All right, so Hofstede's analysis of this enormous wealth of data he got from IBM employees yielded five cultural dimensions on which he believes people from different nations differ. And, and there's no particular order of importance to this. One of them was, I'll talk about each of these in turn. One of them was collectivism. The second was power distance. The third was uncertainty avoidance. The fourth is, is uh, differences gender differences, masculine or feminine orientation. And the last one was performance orientation. And that is basically an artifact of time and patience. But let me just take each of these in turn. So collectivism essentially describes the way people in some nation states make decisions. For example, in the United States, we are highly individual. Uh, we oftentimes make decisions, we know that we're accountable for them, but we believe that that, that rests with us to make decisions individually, whether, whether we do it in a family context or in an organizational context. However, in other nations, and I'll use Japan because it's an excellent example, Japan is a, is a, is a, a profoundly significant manufacturing economy. In Japan, almost all decisions are collective. In fact, there's a Japanese proverb, I studied the, Japan is a nation state in business when I was doing my doctoral stuff because I was sort of fascinated in its growth. And um, what I learned, among the many things that I learned, 
was that most decisions in, in made in Japan are collective decisions. That people people do not want to stand out. There's a Japanese proverb that says it is the tall blade of grass that gets cut first. So in an organizational context in Japan, nobody wants to be that tall blade of grass. It may take uh, people in a Japanese business months to make a decision, and they insist on consensus. Everybody has to agree. Oh dear, we don't do that around here. But my point is that's a cultural difference. Do you make decisions collectively or do you make decisions individually? That's what Hofstede was teasing out. How do cultures differ? So, so this collectivism thing essentially describes how we make decisions, whether, it's, whether it's with emphasis on an individual or emphasis on a group. The power distance thing recognizes that, that, that uh, none of us, I mean, it's rare for anyone in an organization to have equal amounts of power. Just to make this a, a quick moving conversation, in an organizational context, power is simply defined as the ability to influence outcomes. And, and what most of us recognize, certainly in this country, is that we don't all possess the same level of power, do we? So, some, for example, France, um, at the revolution, egalité, liberté, fraternité, equality, liberty, brotherhood. Um, there is no such thing as equality in, in, in a classical sense. We're not equal because we don't have the same endowments. Um, Tiger Woods gets a hundred million dollars a year to play golf. Why don't I? I'm not a good golfer. He possesses skills that I don't have. We are not equally endowed. We have equal access, but it's, 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 un, it's, it's absurd to suggest that we would ever have equal outcomes. So there are always gonna be distributions in power. When I say distributions, diff, people will differentially possess power. Some people have, will have more than others. So. But in some countries, rather, there's this notion of, of, uh, of this egalitarian thing that everybody should be equal. That would describe countries that are socialistic, uh, that sort of a thing, but it certainly doesn't describe us. Uncertainty avoidance. Uh, America, we Americans as a, as a nation, we are incredibly resilient people, um, but we're also very comfortable with ambiguity. Very, very few things in our lives have certainty. Some things do, but very few, very few of those things. So we as a nation are comfortable with ambiguity, with not, with not having certain outcomes. And there are other nations that intensely dislike ambiguity. Um, I, I've spoken, I, when I taught at another university, we had an international MBA program, and, and I would have about 45 German students a year. And the German students, these MBA students, would tell me that, that uh, Almost everybody in Germany, in today's society in Germany, avoids any sort of a decision that could go south because they don't want to be wrong. There, there is an aversion, a risk aversion, among Germans today as I speak. People don't want to make a decision and then be proven wrong. So as a society, as a nation state, Germans like to avoid uncertainty. We as a nation state are fine with that's where innovation comes from and invention and a lot of other cool things that we do as a nation state. The masculine and feminine thing is, is something that, that uh, is an understandable tension. Um, I, I hear from my female friends that there are still situations or pockets of what they would call sexist behavior where women are denied opportunities or treated poorly. I think that's quite rare but I don't dispute that it exists. But there are some nations where women do not have uh, what you and I might call equal rights. Uh, for example, I, I think of the theocracies where, where Islam, the religion, is embedded in the government, like Iran is, is a good example. Um, Iranian women cannot leave their homes without a male member of their family accompanying them. They can't drive, they can't get education, they can't dance, they can't listen to music. They are treated as terribly inferior. They make no decisions. So some cultures, women and, and men have equal opportunity and, and, and equal outcomes, and others there is a great distance between them. So Hofstede was trying to study across cultures what emphasis is given on this relationship between masculinity and femininity. 
And the last thing he talked about in this original study back in 1980, whatever the exact date was, was performance orientation. And essentially, he was trying to, this, this literally was discovered in, in his work, in, in his analytics, and, and his interpretation is that in some cultures, people are patient and have a long-term view. In other cultures, people are impatient with results and have a short-term view. I would fault the United States. If you look at our financial markets, if you look at the stock market, it's nuts. Uh, managers of publicly held companies do crazy things to keep bumping up quarterly results. And if you focus on the next 90 days, you are not focusing on the long term. And yet in Japan, companies take a longer view. There is a uh, electronics company, its name is Mashusta. And, and, and I studied it again back when I was a doctoral student. The company actually had a 250 year plan. Are you kidding me? 250 years? Uh, I'll remind you that that's the length of time that we've been a nation. This company had a 250 year plan. Now, of course, I think that's absurd. Um, it's, it's impossible to predict anything beyond three to five years because of the constant state of change. Whether change comes from market forces or technology or the role of government or a million other things. But it's inarguable that this company, Mashusta, had a 250 year plan. So my point is that, is a nation generally got a, a short term focus? Is it patient? Does it have to have immediate results? Or does it have, does it have a long-term focus where it's perfectly willing to forego progress in the short term if it thinks it's making good decisions that support long-term objectives and goals? So again, Hofstede did this seminal study. I mean, it's been 40 years and it's still the foundation for everybody who, uh, who's the, who considers international business. And, <coughs> excuse me please, in the same discussion, this was, this was Hofstede's five cultural dimensions. He identified these dimensions of which different nation states and different cultures differ. But uh, the authors also talk about, in that same section essentially, is they talk about cultural differences. Just very, very straightforward stuff. Like the concept of time. Uh, we in this country, we, we don't obsess about time, but we're certainly aware of time. Uh, we report to uh, airports to, to catch a flight at a particular time. Um, we report to work or school at a particular time. We have appointments at our doctor's offices. Time drives many of the things that we do. But in other nations, uh, not true. Um, I have a dear friend. Uh, you only get his first name, Eric. Eric uh, was, was born in Mexico, became a naturalized citizen probably 15 years ago. Wonderful guy. Love him, love his wife, love his daughters. Uh, he and I used to hunt together. And I would say something like this, Eric, I'll be at your house at, at 5.30. That'll put us at the hunt club at six and we'll be in the tree stands by 6.15, 6.20. Well, 5.30 to Eric meant sometime Tuesday morning. It, it just a very different perspective on time. So some nations observe it carefully, other nations have much more relaxed standards. Um, the same is true with space. When I say space, I mean physical space. Um, there are most situations I will either shake your hand or hug you if, if we are meeting, especially if I'm greeting someone who's a friend. Um, but of course, I'm gonna shake your hand if, if, it's a, if it's my first introduction. But my point is there are other cultures where being that close to someone else makes them profoundly uncomfortable. And, and they will literally back up and create that distance. Uh, communication. There are so many dimensions in which we differ. I mentioned religion a few moments ago. Um, what happens in, in a Christian environment is not the same as what happens in a Hindu environment or what happens in um, an Islamic environment or others. A religion can have enormous cultural impact on, on the way people conduct their lives. And I, I'd also point out something too, and that is that this differentiates company, countries rather across the world, and that is the rule of law. Uh, we are struggling right now with some uh, with some very unpeaceful protests. We're, we're not talking about protesters. We're talking about evil people who are seizing parts of Seattle and looting and burning and hurting others and that sort of stuff. But my point is, 
We observe the rule of law in this country. We, you and I have protections. I can own property and you can't take it. Uh, if you hurt me, there are consequences. Um, if we sign contracts with banks to borrow money and then repay it. We observe the rule of law. There are many other nations where that is not true. Uh, if you look at uh, the, the man who was the, Carlos Goshen was the CEO of Nissan for gosh, 15 years or so. And, and uh, Nissan of course is based in Japan, the car manufacturer, but Goshen had homes in other parts of the world. He was, uh, I think he was actually a Lebanese national, but he had homes in France and in Lebanon and other places. And uh, Goshen was, was arrested. He flew into Japan on, on a private jet. He was met at the airport by law enforcement people. They arrested him and he was held without any kind of a bail hearing or an arraignment or a preliminary trial or anything else for months. And then he got released and he was in some kind of house arrest and, and a couple of people literally, literally helped him escape the country. They, they put him in a musical crate or something like that. But my point is the rule of law in, in different nations is, is remarkably different. Um, in, in some cases, some places it simply doesn't exist. So when I talk about cultural differences, what, we're, what I'm pulling from the text are differences in, in, in how we observe time, differences in personal space, differences in communication styles, differences in religion that, distraught, that drive behavior. And, and of course, this rule of law thing is huge, enormously huge. The last thing I want to talk to you about in this chapter is on page 148, and it's a discussion of expatriates. An expatriate, definitionally, is just uh, an American citizen who chooses to work uh, and live in another country. I have a young friend, uh, he wasn't a student of mine, but uh, he did an accounting degree here, and uh, he joined one of the big four accounting firms, and I can't even remember which one it is. but. Uh, he took a two-year assignment in Paris, and he so very much enjoyed his time there as a Parisian, he asked if he could extend for another two years. So none of that is bad, but my friend Matt is on what turned into a four-year assignment. A guy that I served with in Vietnam uh, was a career soldier. He did 26 years on active duty in the Army, and when he got out, he was hired by Raytheon, because while he was on active duty in the Army, he got a master's degree in Oriental Studies, and he, he did an emphasis in Japan. So he spoke the language fluently, he could write it, he could read it, he understood the culture. And Raytheon wanted someone with those skills to be its representative. So my dear friend John lived in, in Tokyo for six years. And he came back for 18 months and they sent him back for another five. He has one child, a daughter, and her entire uh, elementary and, and, and uh, education, or entire what we would call K through 12 education, was done in schools in Tokyo. That isn't bad. But my point is that he lived in another nation for 11 years. So I want to read something to you in the text about expatriates. And, and I, the reason I want to read this to you is there are many people, I think, who, who have the notion that uh, working in another country, being an employee of an American firm and working in another country is just extraordinary. And, and it may be. I've never gone down that path. But one of the people, one, one of my faculty, my doctoral program, uh, made a, a major research emphasis across his entire distinguished career was to study ex expatriates, American citizens who served some country abroad for a number of years and then returned to the United States. Daniel was fascinated by their experiences. And that sort of sensitized me to the fact that being an expatriate often raises problems. So I want to, I'm on page 148 right now, and, it, and here's, here's the side heading. U.S. managers on foreign assignments, why do they fail? Oh dear. And here are a couple of things that it points out. It says that uh, early turnover is a common problem with expatriates. And by early turnover, they mean the, company, the, the individual leaves the company. Um, I know partial explanations. For example, if you're in another country for four years, five years, six years, and we just talked about two of my personal friends who've done that, for a minimum of four and a maximum of 11. Um, if you're in another country for that length of time, minimally two things are true. First, you don't have a support system in your own company. There's no opportunity for you to grow or be mentored. Uh, you're not aware of what's happening except in your local branch office. 
So your opportunity to grow and develop is essentially arrested. That's a big deal. That's one of the reasons why so many people leave firms. They actually say that uh, as many as 25% of expatriates leave a company immediately after returning to the United States because they realize that, that there have been so many changes, tech changes, societal changes, organization changes, that they, that they are isolated and they, they can't adapt. Up to 25%, a quarter of the people who go offshore and come back leave the company. Uh, and, and I'm not necessarily sure where they go because there aren't good data on tracking them. So the other thing that's true too is you could successfully argue if you decide to go to Paris for four years or anything like that, that you would become very much embedded in, in, in the French culture and the Parisian culture, and that's good. But at the same time, you're growing as a, as a, as a, a, a visiting non-native Frenchman, you're connectedness to your host country is going away. I mean, time with friends, time with family, social changes. Can you just visualize the changes we've gone through in the last four years in this country? Think through that. Think of the changes that have happened in terms of presidential elections, in terms of uh, uh, new directions, uh, the Make America Great thing. Think of what's happened recently, the enormous disruption of the coronavirus. Uh, look at the impact of, of uh, George Floyd's death and, and, and the, the spillover from that. All I'm saying to you is if you leave this nation for four or five years, you will be so unaware of what's going on. Uh, you can't just you know read a news feed and, and, and be plugged in. So you lose connection with friends, with family, with, with uh, shifts in, our, in your own native society. So I'm not trying to persuade you to do anything or to not do anything. What I do want to share with you, I just want to emphasize, since this chapter is about managing across borders, since we're talking about international business, that there is an enormous downside, there's a very big risk to anyone who chooses to be an expatriate. Now, my sense is if you took a short-term assignment, I don't know what that means. If you went offshore for eight months or 18 months or something like that to put a new IT system in place or get a new factory up to speed or who knows what. I, I think that that has less potential to be damaging to you individually and to your career and to your connectedness with your home society, your home nation. But again, I don't know what the break point is. I don't know how long is too long. I just want you to be sensitive to the fact that this is not a Bill Norton opinion. This is data driven. And this has gone on for the 30 years that I've been part of academia. I'm thinking about reaching back to grad school uh, with Daniel Feldman, the man who was doing a lot of high quality research and expatriates returning to the States and how they socialized, how they adapted, how they struggled, where they failed. Uh, simply be aware of the fact that a disproportionately high number of expatriates return to the States, leave the company, and have an enormously difficult time sort of adjusting getting reacquainted with their host home, rather, their home nation. So again, that's just a point of awareness. I'm not trying to persuade you of anything, but if you look at the side heading. Why do they fail, U.S. managers on foreign assignments? It's big stuff, and, and I simply want you to be aware of it. So that wraps up this conversation. And that means that I now have to share with you the attendance verification question. I have been approached to be a voiceover of a character in an animated film. Which character in Frozen 3, for which character in Frozen 3 would I be the voiceover? That's the question. Love you. Talk to you soon.